Thank you, folks. It's a pleasure to be here addressing you. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about how American healthcare compares to healthcare and health in uh, other wealthy countries. Uh, it's my lecture is going to break down into three sections, basically: an overview of American healthcare in comparison to the other wealthy nations. We'll talk about uh, how things started to change in the early 1980s and what drove American healthcare off the rails. So it's extremely expensive, and yet Americans are extremely unhealthy in comparison to the citizens of the other wealthy countries. And then finally, I want to talk about uh, what we can do to fix it. And uh, these are deep problems, and uh, there aren't quick fixes, uh, but we'll talk about that. Um, so first, an overview of American healthcare. Uh, there's three ways <clears throat> to compare the health of populations. The quickest way and the one most frequently used is life expectancy. <clears throat> that takes the uh, current mortality rate at each year of life at the present and um, puts that together into a composite picture that projects how long current Americans are going to live. The second way to do it, which is far more dimensional, is healthy life expectancy, which is the number of years, not that we live in toto, but that we live in good health. And years of disease are prorated. So if somebody uh, is uh, lives to be 86, but they had chronic renal failure, say, for six years, starting at age 80, and that compromised the quality of their life, by 50%, then their uh, healthy life expectancy would be measured at 83, half of, half of the six years. <clears throat> and then finally, the most accurate way to compare uh, countries is on age-adjusted mortality rates. And the reason why that's more accurate is because different countries have different um, average age in the population. And the older a population is, the higher the mortality rate is. So age-adjusted mortality rates correct for the differences, the age differences in populations and ensure that those comparisons are uh, accurate. So first, life expectancy compared to other wealthy nations. Okay, I I'm sorry. Uh, the uh, slides before this weren't uh, visually important. So the, uh, this is the first way to measure, compare countries, uh, life expectancy in the U.S. compared to other wealthy countries. And you can see, um, <clears throat> you can see that back around 1982, when I first went into medical practice as a family physician, uh, the United States was pretty close to the average of 10 other countries. Um, but as time went on, the curve separated and longevity in the United States fell further and further behind the other countries. So that by the time we got to 2019, which is an important landmark because that's before the COVID uh, pandemic started uh, and the data aren't uh, distorted by COVID, by COVID. Uh, when we got to 2019, Americans were living 3.8 years less than the uh, citizens in the other countries. And then when we get to 2022, We've lost even more uh, years of life, and we now live 4.7 years less than the citizens in the other wealthy countries. But if we turn to healthy life expectancy, the Americans' healthy life expectancy has fallen from 38th in the world in 2000 to a tie for 68th in 2019. Citizens of Japan now live eight years longer in good health and Canadians 5.2 years longer in good health than Americans. And it's uh, particularly informative to look at how uh, we are doing compared to China in healthy life expectancy. In 2000, these four data points go from 2000 up to 2019 for both the United States and China. And you can see in 2000, Americans lived 2.1 years more in good health than the Chinese did. But the time, by the time we get to 2019, the uh, Chinese are living 2.4 years longer than we are. <clears throat> and this is particularly informative 
because between 2010 and 2019, the healthy life expectancy of Americans actually went down from 66.7 years to 66.1 years. It went down. Uh, it went down by 0.6 years. During those 10 years, there's only three other countries in the world whose life expectancy went down more than Americans. Those three countries are Syria, Yemen, and Venezuela. Now that is not good company to be in. So this is a real crisis. And as China was gaining on life expectancy, so it surpassed us by as much as we surpassed them, by more than we surpassed them in 2000, China in, in 2019 was spending $11,582, excuse me, the United States was spending more than $11,000 and China was spending $540. In other words, we're spending like tw 20 times as much as China is to achieve these inferior results. <clears throat> and then if we go to the third way to compare uh, health between countries, the um, age-adjusted mortality rates, in this chart, we see 1980 to 2020, um, and you see the excess deaths of Americans in comparison to the citizens of the other wealthy countries based on age-adjusted mortality rates. And you can see in 1980, uh, in the early 80s, Americans actually were doing better. There were fewer excess deaths in the United States. Uh, in 1982, 50,000 fewer Americans died than would have been predicted by the age-adjusted mortality rate in the average of the other countries. But by the time we got to 20, it's 2019 actually here, by the time we got to 2019 before COVID started, there were 622,000 excess American deaths each year compared to the citizens of the other wealthy countries. And then if we go to, um, if we go to 2000, uh, in 21, we see that the excess mortality rate has leapt up again so that 1.1 million Americans are in excess, are dying compared to the citizens of the other wealthy nations. And 1.1 million deaths a year is equivalent to 3,000 deaths every day. It's like a 9-11 disaster every single day of the year, year in, year out. This should be head front page news. I mean, the 9-11 disaster changed the course of American history. And yet this is going on and it's not getting any press coverage at all. It's hard to uh, get this out into the media. Uh, it's really alternative media that's only alternative media that's willing to cover this. <clears throat> but the important fact here is that, well, 1.1 million Americans in excess are dying each year. We are paying in the United States 12,000, over 12 and a half thousand dollars per year. Well, the citizens of comparable countries are spending half that much. And if you look, <clears throat> look at that, if you subtract what we are spending in the United States from what the other countries are spending, that's $5,900 per person per year, and you multiply the $5,900 times uh, the population of the United States, 334 million people, you see that we are spending $2 trillion a year, $2 trillion a year in excess of the other countries. Well, 1.1 million Americans are dying in excess each year. It's craziness. Now, to put $2 trillion in perspective, the annual U.S. budget deficit, which is enough to create political crisis, crises about funding the government, is $1.73 trillion a year. It's less than we're wasting each year on health care. $2 trillion is about two and a half times our annual military budget that we're wasting. And it's almost as much as the total global military spending. That's $2.2 trillion a year. So this is an enormous amount of money that we are wasting in the United States to achieve horrendously inferior health for the American people. 
If we look at the function of the American healthcare system, this is a study that compared the access to care, the uh, process of care, administrative efficiency, equity, and healthcare outcomes in 10 countries. And here we have higher system performance and lower system performance. And here we have higher spending as a percentage of GDP and lower spending in, as a percentage of GDP. And we see that these 10 countries group quite tightly in terms of the percentage of their GDP they spend on healthcare and the performance of their systems. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the United States isn't on this, on this uh, graph yet because this is where the United States is. We're totally an outlier in both cost and spending and function of the American healthcare system. So the question is, how did we get here? This is a disastrous place to be. We talk about national priorities. And this, there's 1.1 million excess Americans dying each year, and we're wasting $2 trillion. Now, sometimes we think, well, that's other people. That's people who don't look like us. That's people who aren't wealthy, they're poor. But that's not us, because those of us who are privileged in this society, we can escape that because it's just a matter of poverty or, or racism or sexism, whatever. But that's not the case. This is a study that was published in JAMA and it compared in, in, in this comparative effectiveness study of six health outcomes, white US citizens in the one and 5% highest income counties. So these are the most privileged folks obtained better health outcomes than average US citizens, but had worse outcomes for infant mort and maternal mortality, colon cancer, childhood acute lymphocytic leukemia, and acute myocardial infarction compared with the average citizens of other developed countries. In other words, the most privileged Americans, the wealthiest, the whitest uh, cohort of Americans has worse health than the average citizens in the other developed countries, which are spending $2 trillion a year less. And we're gonna see as uh, we go on that most of our health is not determined by the healthcare we get, but by the environment we live in and um, the, uh, the, uh, the social determinants of health, housing and education and income and so forth. And um, it's those issues that account for most of the difference in the health between the United States and the other wealthy countries. So now we turn to the question, how did we become such an outlier? We were doing fine up until the early 80s. We were actually uh, on age-adjusted uh, mortality rates. We were actually uh, doing better than the other countries. We were spending a little bit more, but not very much more. So how, how, how did we become such an outlier? And this, um, the next two slides are from uh, an article that was published in the journal Science uh, in 1982. You can see in the small print down here. And this article marked the pivot point where the United States turned from a country that had decent health care for a reasonable price to a completely dysfunctional health care system. And this is important to me because I was a Robert Wood Johnson fellow from 1980 to 82. I was studying uh, statistics and research uh, design and epidemiology and uh, analyzing the, the journals critically for uh, misrepresentations of data and so forth. And at that point in time, commercial influence was not playing a role in what the journals were presenting. However, we were right at the point when things were gonna change. And this article from the journal Science says grants from the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation are fewer in number and harder to get. For universities to turn to alternative sources of research support is not only prudent, but downright essential. And it was especially essential, not just because the, the percentage of grants that were get, getting funded went down, but it was especially essential because managed care was just starting to play a role in the reimbursement of academic medical centers and hospitals. And the, the academic medical centers were getting squeezed at just the time the, the uh, federal support of research 
uh, was going down. So this created quite a problem. And what happened is, this is a quote from the article in Science, scientists who 10 years ago would have snubbed their academic noses at industrial money, now eagerly seek it out. So when I was in medical school, I started medical school in 1972, it was rare that a doctor was uh, had a financial tie to a drug company, and it was not looked upon as a, a, as a status symbol or a, um, a badge of, uh, of uh, prestige. It was looked upon as commercialism. But as the situation changed and the academics needed to turn to commercial support, they started to, as Barbara Culleton said, eagerly seek it out. Now, another thing happened at just about the same time. The Bayh-Dole Act came in. Um, uh, I'm old enough to remember when uh, Japanese cars, imported Japanese cars were a novelty uh, when everybody drove American cars, Who everybody who wasn't eccentric drove American cars. But the Bayh-Dole Act was passed, and that was passed because the federal government was funding research, but the people who and institutions that did the research couldn't benefit from commercializing that research. So the, many of the patents that were developed with federal grants were lying uh, fallow uh, in, in uh, file cabinets and not being brought to, uh, to the market so that the uh, discoveries could benefit Americans. So the Bayh-Dole Act was an attempt to rectify that. Nonprofit research institutions were drawn into the commercial realm by the passage of the University and Small Business Patent Procedures Act of 1980, Bayh-Dole. This legislation allowed nonprofit research institutions to commercialize discoveries made by their scientists while conducting federally funded research and to retain any profits derived from those discoveries. Now, recently, we've had a, <clears throat> an enormously dramatic example of that, where the uh, NIH developed the technology to make mRNA vaccines um, very quickly 